Well, thank you so much. It's really great to be here. I'm going to be talking about a really particular project that I shared with um, some fellow uh, colleagues and activists that began about six years ago. Um, so I'm going to walk you through that project and how it was you know, historically rooted um, in the women's rights movement of the 1970s. And then I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the how hard how hard activism is and how, how hard it is to kind of keep um, keep your eyes keep your eyes on the prize. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna share sound just in case. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, uh, so I really want to start with um, Antebellum, which is a journal that comes out in the early, uh, the early months of 1977. It's, called, it's labeled a New South Carolina Journal for Women, cost two dollars, and this is the premier edition. This is a close up of the image here. This was on the cover of the first issue of Antebellum. This was on the very back page of Antebellum. And you'll see the kind of figures and the people, their names are listed. And if you're, you're really paying attention to the initial picture, you'll notice that there are two people whose images were not in the, in the photograph. And that's number five, which is meant to be the persona that is Antebellum, who was labeled as a preservationist. And number 10, who was the total woman who, of course, does not exist. Um, so Antebellum was both meant to be an idea of a woman who was happy to have made it to where she was and to, to feel confident in her challenges or in her ability to challenge the status quo in South Carolina. Um, this was the note that was at the very beginning. I'll just read in, in part here at the beginning. Here it is at last, Antebellum, a new South Carolina journal for women. I have been joked about, ridiculed, admonished, while at the same time praised and congratulated for doing it. The question has been, why would a 60-year-old, why would a 60-year-old quote Biddy, by the name of Antebellum, ever think she could organize some publication for women in the Palmetto State? That's simple enough to answer. This kind of publication is long overdue. And she goes on to talk about the mission of the magazine, which is to give a voice to so many South Carolina, uh, South Carolinian women um, who, had, who had suffered under sexism and racism in the Palmetto, in the Palmetto State. Now, we know that there was no 60-year-old quote biddy um, named Auntie Bellum, and really this was a, cl a collaboration of quite a few women. The first issue, uh, the artistic director for the first issue was um, Elizabeth McClendon, who was an activist, still very active in town. Um, she created these beautiful images. She has the quote from Sarah Grimke, um, this image um, with a quote beneath it of Sojourner Truth. But the issue itself covered a few different things. It covered history, a mini Seneca Falls convention, which they're referring to the 1870 convention of the, um, of the Rollins sisters for women's voting rights at, uh, during Reconstruction. Um, they talk about sexual abuse and domestic violence, um, grassroots women's studies programs, the, which is a fascinating article that dives into the, the nation women's studies programs that are starting to rise all over the nation and where South Carolina is in that development, which is not very far. Um, so, this author, Leslie Todd, interviews high school teachers throughout the state to see how they're preparing students for the idea of women's studies so that when they get to college, they're demanding to be taught or to major in um, something like women's studies. Their arts are covered. Um, and also around South Carolina, which was one of the parts of this that struck me when I, when I first when I first got my hands on an issue of antebellum, and that is the idea that it, it is so useful to have in one place everything that's going on in the state that could benefit, that could benefit women. 
Um, you also have an interview, interviews abounded. Um, you have an interview with um, uh, um, Basket Weaver in, in Charleston. In the second issue, there was a massive health compendium. And I'll let you take a look at some of this. I don't know, some of it's a little too small, I'm sure for you to read. But it included a lot. Um, the state of abortion law in South Carolina, which is something I wrote about um, in 2015, 2016, 17, 18, something that we've had to revisit every single year. Um, what So in the aftermath of Roe v. Wade, what was the state of um, abortion access? Um, how had South Carolina legislators tried to, to, to limit access um, to abortion and reproductive care? Um, there was a list of how much you should be paying for your doctor. There was another article that I didn't include here that was the patient's bill of rights, the kind of things that you should be asking your doctor, that you have a right to ask your doctor, that your doctor is not necessarily going to offer up um, willingly. There's also this list of abortion clinics, which as of right now is a little bit longer than the one we, we have. Um, but it lists the clinics. It gives their phone number, of course. It also lists the approximate price of the abortion, um, depending on where, where you went. Um, it gave all the different ways that you could pay. And then the very last, the very last clinic that's listed, the Greenville Clinic, it also offers a little bit on the, the atmosphere. Um, it says very feminine, bright atmosphere in the Greenville Women's Clinic. There's articles on, on midwives and nurse practitioners as well. So all of this was in one issue of Antebellum. This again is the second issue in 1977. This was the kind of the summer fall issue. The third issue of Antebellum featured Majeska Simpkins. And so she's on the cover here. And there's a photograph of her working the window at, um, at the bank. And, and, and also has a, an image of her and fellow activists um, in Houston in 1977. This issue included as well, um, and I'm going to show you the table of contents for these, these, these first three issues. Um, interviews with um, domestic violence uh, survivors and the uh, tribunal on crimes against women that was held in Charleston in 1977. It also has um, a few interviews and articles that I'll talk about in just a second. Okay, so the contents, here's the first one, which is really small. So the first issue is really small. Um, and it really quickly throughout this year expands to include a lot of issues. Now, the, the second is the second issues on table of contents. I could have been a little more clear with that. Um, and then the third column is the third issue. So there's the interview with Majeska Simpkins. There's another interview with Mabel Pollitzer. So I'm sure at some point you ended up um, discussing Anita Pollitzer in the class. And this is her sister, an activist in Charleston, who by this point is in her 90s. Um, there's an article on belly dancing. There's um, an article about Julia Peterkin. There's article about the arts. There's an article about kind of self-care and self and self-help as we dis, uh, describe it today. And then there's always um, photographs and art and poetry and short stories. So the final issue that we have of Antebellum is this one that comes out in uh, 1978 and it was a double issue so it was big. And if you look at the masthead, you'll see that it is no longer a South Carolina journal. Um, it is a Southern journal for women. So the, the response to this journal was, was so great that she decided that she wanted, um, you know, Auntie Bellum, uh, the editor, of course, her name was Mary Bateman, um, but her, but Bateman and the rest of her staff, oh, excuse me, decided to expand the magazine to include the South. Um, and with that expansion, she, I can only imagine that she felt free to start ex expanding and broadening the scope of who she could talk to, the interviews that she could conduct, the places in the South that, that, she, that she could talk about. So there's an interview with Elizabeth Cotton, um, the folk and blues, the singer and guitarist who 
you know, I say discovered, um, but she always knew she was a musician, but um, the Seeger family who she was a nanny for um, really gives her the, um, um, the microphone and kind of the funding to start recording. So there's an interview with Elizabeth Cotton, North Carolina native. And then there's, uh, in, in addition to the arts and the, you know, the other articles that are that become typical in, on Antebellum, there is a historic tour of, of women um, in, in the South and the historically significant places. Um, something that we are right now contending with in South Carolina with the city of women here in Columbia, but also kind of crowding the field with um, so much to contend with with the Heritage Act. Um, there's, oh yeah, no, sorry, but um, uh, Pete Seeger. All right. There was a question about whether it was Bob Seeger. It is Pete Seeger and his family. Okay, so I get a hold of this magazine in 2014. And the first thing I think is, wow, um, most of these issues are things that I still talk about in my classes, even in history classes, right? I mean, constantly making these connections to the present um, and also with my friends and my family and my colleagues. And as an intellectual project, I wanted to bring it back. So the first thing that you do is in 2015 to start something is you create a Facebook group, and which is what I did. And I invited everyone that I knew to come and share and to share the magazines, right? We scanned the magazines, we loaded them in there and had everybody kind of take a look and see what they thought. And then we met um, and here's, you know, my, hey, you know, Graham Duncan. So my partner, Graham Duncan is a, a curator of manuscripts at the South Carolinian Library. And he's the one that introduced me to this, to this magazine. Um, so, you know, Graham paves the way for me to have these things in my hands. And then I try to get them in as many other people's hands as I possibly can. And, and ask people, you know, what, what, what do we do? We should, you know, what does it take to bring something like this back? Um, enough people wanted to be a part of this. And it was, you know, it, it, there was artists, there was young people who just graduated from college. Um, there were photographers, um, there, there were a few people that were down for trying to build a website, which ended up being a very difficult project. Um, somebody tries, you know, another person tried to help us come up with a logo. Um, I wrote out a call for submissions, and you can imagine my embarrassment when I look today and there was a typo from <laughs> six years ago <laughs> that I had not noticed that, you know, anyways, so the call for submissions, I used a Tallulah Bankhead quote, fill what is empty, empty what is full, and scratch where it itches, um, to talk about politics, history, women's health, music, true crime, um, I was ahead of our, our time, uh, motherhood, sisterhood, Southern culture, and anything that we, you know, hadn't thought about before. Um, also, we met in the South Carolina, which for those of you who spotted it in that initial photograph of Antebellum, that was where they met for the photograph for that first issue for the cover. Um, we ironed out the, you know, we, the name. So we called it Antebellum. For me, as you know, again, as an intellectual project, while we were putting it together, the whole reason why we were doing it was because these women had done it before us. And so um, the name was part of how we were um, paying our respects and celebrating what had been done before us. And our tagline was an honest, unapologetic voice for Southern women. The, the yeah, well, I could tell you the whole story about the website, but I'll let you just imagine how difficult it is, but then how difficult it is to um, create a navigable website that works. Um, we decided against creating an actual physical publication because of money, um, but we wanted to make, you know, the point of contact for most people, social media. So we had social media accounts on Facebook and at the time, Instagram, which were the two main ways that people um, got to us in order to get you know, to our website. And then we threw a lot of parties. We threw parties, so many parties. Um, Robert was at some of our parties. <laughs> um, we had some in our homes. We had some in bars. You know, in retrospect, having so many of these events in bars was something that I 
wouldn't do again. I can only imagine, you know, how many people just didn't want to go to a bar in order to, to meet us and to understand what we were trying to do and to let me or one of the other women that we worked with convince them to, to write for us or to produce or to create um, for the magazine in some, in some way. We had karaoke parties. We had happy hours that we told Boozy Bellums um, and we had music parties. Um, and part of the reason for those parties was to raise money. We did, you know, we needed, we needed money. Like any organization, you know, we, we decided early on that we wanted to be a 501c3 so that we um, could do nonprofit work. We also, that was another question. We did lots of trivia. Um, Amanda Hamilton was among us. Uh, she's in here tonight. We we tried to raise as much money as we could through these these parties um, and these events. Uh, you know, to keep up the website. We never made enough to pay somebody to create our website, but we did make enough money to keep the website going and to get it up to speed. Um, we also applied. You know. To, for 501c3 status since we were able to do that as well. In our first year, we did everything that we possibly could. We worked so hard to be everywhere, everywhere. And I don't know that we, we said no to anyone that first year. We just were so excited to be everywhere. Um, we were at Pride, we were at, we had merch, um, you know, trying to make money. We were at the museum. We went to domestic violence and sexual assault training um, through the county. We shot the bird to Confederates. We organized um, to raise money for um, people who were victims of the flood in 2015. We showed, we, we made um, you know, our voices loud and clear when it came to protests in the wake of tragic events like the murders um, in Charleston. And we supported music and we supported um, politicians and we supported other organizations whose missions we just uh, were so enamored with um, and who were doing a lot of the work that we wanted to, to, to amplify. Um, we also wrote, uh, we wrote and so many other people wrote. When I, when I talked to Becky about putting this together, uh, I was nervous about talking about this. I really hasn't, have not done the kind of postmortem on Antebellum and, and later in Sweetened. But when I was looking at how many people I know, and then people I, I, you know, I never really spoke to again who wrote for us, it was, um, it was emotional. Um, we also were, we also supported. I mean, I should also mention that Girls Rock Columbia was a real segue for a lot of us into various um, activist organization, activist movements. Um, Girls Rock Columbia began in 2012. We had our first camp in 2013, and it was, it was, it, it gave older women like me a voice in ways that I, I didn't realize that I needed. Um, and so, music was also a big part of what we did at, at Auntie Bellum as well. Um, we had. We made videos of women of musicians and songwriters around town, and we created a, a coloring book, or we, we solicited the drawings for a coloring book of you know, important South Carolina women that never came together. But we have so many drawings, and they're, and they're remarkable. Um, we had a podcast. Um, Becky was on our podcast. Uh, we, we had all our irons in what felt like all of the fires. And we just kept working. We were at TAPS. We worked with organizations like the Progressive Network. We worked with REN. We worked with Decalage. We worked with Tell Them, later REN. Um, we worked with Richland County Library to organize um, writing workshops for young people. We were at Soda City. We were at Arts and Drafts. Anywhere we could be so that we could talk to more women and other folks about um, what they thought South Carolina and the South should be and what made them angry and what made them happy. And um, we, we listened and, you know, it was a heady time. So what, 
what what went wrong? Um, you know, why does this uh, organization not, you know, why are we not still talking about it existing today? Um, leading into, so to, throughout 2015, we worked hard, um, in, you know, kind of establishing our presence um, among activists, but also among other organizations and um, at, at the colleges. We also, um, you know, made other connections. So while our core stayed pretty small, we had a lot of people that we collaborated with and we tried to kind of keep expanding that network. We worked, um, I, I, you know, worked a lot with musicians. I tried to, you know, amplify as many mus musicians as I possibly could. Um, other folks had different areas that they worked on, um, particularly LGBTQ issues. Um, but again, being present was, how we um, how we showed our support and I and also stayed relevant. Um, the the months leading up into the 2016 election were exhausting. Um, we, as an organization, I I would argue that we were a little surly when it came to voting for. Hillary Clinton in the end. We'd all been, you know, Bernie supporters. And we, you know, we're kind of holding our noses and voting for Hillary Clinton. Early on in the year, we'd written this kind of dare about, you know, is will Hillary Clinton, here she is, you know, coming to South Carolina for, for the primary, but will she ever come back if she's president of the United States? And the the debates leading up to the election were also were just full of trauma, um, Donald Trump being just the, the, um, the, at the time, we just thought that he was a nominee who, a disgusting person who would, you know, quickly be silenced in the aftermath of the 2016 election, but it brought up a lot of trauma for a lot of people, sex, survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence, um, but also as, um, you know, as, as a state um, with a diverse population and you know the gathering power of movements like um, Black Lives Matter and the loud voices of the dreamers, I mean, there were a lot of people pushing back against um, against against Donald Trump. And it was it was we were all talking about it all the time, and we were trying so hard to talk with each other. And the worst case scenario, right, was that um, it, for this part, for this election, was um, in, in many ways, right, um, <laughs> was that Donald Trump was going to win. I, I put this up because what the 2016 election lays bare, you know, this is my wrist, a white woman wearing this nasty woman um, bracelet that was given to me. It's a nice bracelet, you know, it was. I'm wearing a white sweater for the suffrage movement. Um, and in so many ways, I would argue that the 2016 election laid bare how much organizations like mine and a lot of others had to learn about what was wrong with America um, and how, how much more diverse that movement, right? Um, we just had a lot more to learn. Um, in the wake of the 2016 election, we tried to learn. We, we again, we put ourselves in, in every corner that we possibly could to hear more. We published more than we'd ever published before. Um, uh, we had really wonderful discussions. Um, this is a talk at Newberry College. This down there in the bottom right-hand corner is Deckel Edge, Robert there, um, Miles, and also, of course, uh, Becky. Um, this is um, us at the Progressive Networks rally in the wake of the election, which was a powerful movement of unity. And we got tired. Um, when we, when we, when we looked around, we thought, you know, and this is as, you know, we're, we're working um, and, and all of us that were a part of this organization were 
were activists and Unsweetened was part of our work, but a lot of us were also engaged in other activist work. Um, we all had jobs, most of us on staff had jobs working for other nonprofits. Work that doesn't stop isn't, isn't any sort of nine to five work, right? I teach at a small college um, in HBCU and, it, and the, the work never stops. And so the, the, you know, the grind of, um, of antebellum was starting was really starting to wear on us by, by 2017. And in addition to that, we looked at the name and thought, it's time, right? This is no longer um, an intellectual project that we can simply explain this name so that people will understand where we're coming from, right? If somebody logs onto this, sees it and thinks, ugh, Auntie Bellum sounds like an ode to some sort of white feminism that we were working hard to, to fight back against. Um, and so we applied to a Riggs Partners Create-a-thon um, kind of PR event. Uh, and they, you know, we, we told them what we what our issues were, and that was what we wrote to them. We said, you know, this is what we do. Um, and they they you know were brainstorming for a day which is what they do like for 24 hours rigged partners donates their time to folks like us to come up with a better solution for what we want and so for us um they came up with unsweetened and this was what they wrote um it's long but i'm going to talk well and maybe if you if you'd like to read it to say that it took a you know so this ends up being the about unsweetened. So from Monty Ballum to unsweetened, this is where was, that was the shift. Um, so by 2017, late 2017, this is the, these are the changes that we had made and they're, and they're big changes. And, you know, we're, um, we are open and we're honest about why we're making those changes, but the changes were um, our masthead and the deeper changes were kind of attempting to tackle what was effectively kind of our core staff, um, you know, a white organization or an organization led by white women. And the conversations that went forward from there were some of the most productive and hard and challenging conversations, um, you know, with people that I'd been working for for years um, on this project. They were hard um, and they were emotional and they were, so um, they were they were transformative. Um, after after the change, you know, we didn't do everything right. Um, we we made a lot of mistakes. I personally made mistakes, and in some ways, I didn't handle the wake of those mistakes in the best way. Um, but we marched forward, and we kept going. Uh, we were able to expand, and then we started to just contract. Um, I will say this, that the Me Too movement was an opportunity for us um, in many ways, but it was also um, a movement that cracked open so many organizations um, and so many kind of tight-knit seams in towns and cities across the United States. Um, but it, it was also something that made um, that made our work that much more um, uh, just e exhausting. And so as people started to peel away um, over, over that year, um, our resources started to dwindle. I mean, it just became hard doing this work, reading and editing survivor stories um, and not being able to really take a break because you know we needed all hands on deck all the time. And so people just started peeling away. Um, and it, it, the project itself became hard to maintain. Um, so the, the story is that this type of work is difficult. Um, and even with the best of intentions and even with the, the you know, energetic, smart, um, wonderful people, there is, all, there is a toll to this work as well. Um, and, and in retrospect, I wish we'd had more time to just kind of 
sit down and just talk about self-care um, rather than trying to be on a grind and trying to do as much as we as we did. Um, for me, as you know, I, I ended up coping with with Antibellum, I really started focusing on um, music and I started interviewing a lot of musicians. And I started interviewing a lot of musicians about the problems with um, sexual abuse within their scenes. And as that um, kind of carried forward, I've been able to maintain a lot of those music relationships. And um, kind of my hope is to, is to continue more with that work as well. Um, but if you would allow me to, uh, the very last thing that we did, let me see what the, um, thanks. Uh, I want to show you the last thing. So the last year that we were, that we were active, um, we recorded two videos. One was um, an amazing artist in town um, named Mari, um, and she did a cover of a Claro song. I think I'm saying that right. I am not um, a young person. And I, you know, but the, the other one, the very, very last video that we recorded, and we never even put it on the website. It just, it never, it wasn't edited and ready in time for us because I, uh, the, the big explosion was that I, you know, my job became exponentially harder, like literally overnight, and I could not give one more second. Um, and in addition to that, there's this guilt. I mean, if you have a job that you care about and you also have this project that you work on, you know, making sure that you're giving a, enough attention to both of those projects is, is always gonna be a source of, of pain and guilt. Um, but this last, and I always felt really guilty about never being able to show this. I'm hoping that you guys will let me let me see if I can, it's really, I'll only show you a little bit of it. This is um, Kelly Mac, um, uh, McCullough McLaughlin is a folk singer um, here in town and she um, sings a song to Kay and she, she, we recorded the video in the homes that had been ruined in the 2015 flood. Now this is a few years later, the homes have all been gutted, the church is on its last legs um, and she's singing about pain um, and, and hardship. I hope you can hear this. Um, Robert, if you'll nod, if you can. leave it there. I'll, I'll put the, the um, link in the chat for those of you who are interested in watching and watching the rest of it. But thank you so much for letting me talk about this. It's a, like I said, it was, it's something that um, I'm glad that I was able to, to do. Thanks. Thanks so much, Megan. I think we all appreciate your, your honesty here talking about your own experiences with activism here in South Carolina. And, and I think for all of us here, again, these were lessons that I think we can apply to what we've learned so far and what we'll also continue to learn about as well. Again, this, this kind of work, the work of improving society for your fellow human beings, this is not easy work. It is draining work. It is difficult work. It's certainly necessary work. But as we've just heard from Megan there, it, it's not easy work at all. 